Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Michael Crump. I am a product manager at Microsoft on Azure, and I'm joined with me with uh, Cecil Phillips. He is a developer advocate on Azure as well. Uh, today, we're going to actually just spend it completely inside of uh, the portal and Visual Studio and a couple of other things and just show you a couple of our favorite tips and tricks after working with the Azure platform over the last uh, couple of years. Okay, great. So now that I'm inside of the portal, uh, a couple of features that I believe that some people may or may not be aware of is there is actually the ability to use keyboard shortcuts. So if you need to jump back and forth between different types of dashboards, uh, you can do that fairly easily using the G plus D command here. Um, another cool thing that's inside of the actual portal is that you have the ability to double click on a dashboard and you're able to change the themes. Now, it may be turned off right now. Oh, there it goes. You can double click and you're able to quickly change these themes. Now, I've heard you. Uh, some people said, okay, you know, that's kind of annoying. Uh, there is the ability to come in here inside of the portal settings and you can turn that feature actually back off again. So you can turn that off if, if you would like to. Um, another thing that I found is fairly interesting, let me go ahead and switch back over to my uh, darker theme, is that once you're inside of the portal, if you decide that you want to uh, edit the dashboard and start adding your own widgets, most people add different things like charts, as you can see, you know, I've had like a, a Linux one on here and some of the other quick start tutorials, but there's also a whole category of different types of, of widgets that you can add in. And one of my favorite is actually Markdown. So Markdown is one feature uh, that I find that it's pretty easy to go ahead and get started with this. And a lot of people use Markdown in a couple of different ways. And the way that we've been using it is, is that we've been using it as simply some different types of tile headers. So in this example, um, if you press the full screen, you can see I'm using some of the Markdown up here at the top but also I'm customizing some of my complete uh, charts and dashboards. This is also in full screen mode. And another thing that I see a lot of people that don't really use is the full screen feature of a dashboard. So if you create a custom dashboard, you will be able to uh, take that dashboard, put it on a big TV, and your team, as you're working, uh, you could swing by and actually uh, see the performance of your different types of resources that you have in Azure. Another thing uh, that you can do here is use this thing called Cloud Shell. Now, a lot of people are they're familiar with using uh, pieces of Cloud Shell, but they also aren't quite familiar sometimes that PowerShell exists. So PowerShell is a feature that you can switch back onto. Uh, another thing about Cloud Shell, which allows you to manage your Azure resources, is that this shell, if I just do a ls-l here, you can see that I, I have my directory listing. But I could also come through, and as you see, this is using a storage, so I'm able to use up and down, and all of the keystrokes that I've already typed in before, uh, I can simply go back to those and, and load those up. Before I actually try one, um, the other thing that's very, very cool about Cloud Shell is that if you use Cloud Shell, you can access it in a number of different ways. Uh, here we are, just shell.azure.com, and I'm back inside of the uh, Cloud Shell. Another, uh, another thing that you can do here, if you are a big command line user, uh, that same uh, Azure CLI 2.0 Cloud Shell, uh, you can access it through the command prompt, and the font's a little big there, but uh, it's also the same exact thing that's located in here. One cool feature that we're starting to add to some of our documentation is, is that there may be a command inside of the actual portal that you may want to actually give it a shot. So you can actually access the Cloud Shell directly through uh, the, the documentation. So if I clicked on this, uh, you can see, okay, I'm now inside of Cloud Shell. And in this example, this was about, hey, here's how you can create VMs easily. I could actually just hit the copy command here and then click try it and make sure I'm logged in again, uh, I would be able to actually paste that in. It looks like it may not work for me. 
That's okay. Uh, it does work. Uh, the other thing is that I wanted to jump into some of our different types of features with Azure App Services, one of the most popular things. And so for App Services, I'm going to actually just select one that I've been uh, using. Let's go into uh, maybe this auto tweet one. If I select this account and go back here, select all, and make sure I get this loaded up. There we go. Maybe there's too many. There we go. If I go into my web starter kit, uh, one feature that I find that a lot of people haven't taken quite an advantage of is the concepts of tags. Like most folks are kind of familiar with things like development slots. Um, but you can also use tagging to quickly say these are key value pairs. So for example, if I want to talk about environments, I can add production. I could add this if I wanted to, uh, if I wanted to call out maybe you know, a, a dev environment. Um, but the other thing that's really cool about tags, especially as you're starting to work with more and more Azure resources, uh, is this concept of billing. So when I worked at previous places, we had different departments that had to deal with the billing. This was an easy way, once I got the bill at the end of the month, that I could say, okay, this department was responsible uh, for this much, this much of the bill. It's a great way, great and easy way. Um, also, when you have some of the common uh, problems, uh, you can actually use uh, the ability to diagnose and solve problems using this, uh, this button. And inside of this, it says, hey, you know, here's a couple of things that I can help you with. You know, things like web app uh, performance. And since this is an ASP.NET application, uh, it automatically is going to say showing tools for ASP.NET. And there's different varieties of like check connection strings. This is actually one of the places that I go first, where most people may go directly inside of, uh, uh, in, inside of like Visual Studio or try to start looking at logs. But you can also change the stack. So if I'm working with Java, as you can expect, we now see a Java memory dump and then a Java thread dump. And if I was working with PHP, for example, you can start seeing we have PHP logs and PHP processes. Another feature that I find is very helpful is backups. A lot of people, when they're using backups, they only think that that backup will take a snapshot of just their web app. Um, but it does actually a lot more than that. Inside of the backups, if you click on backups, you can change your backup schedule. So you can actually customize this. But also, if you're like me, you have a, a SQL database maybe added in, you can also include that in the backup. So you kind of have your one-stop shop for uh, taking care of your backups. Another feature that I found a lot of folks aren't taking advantage of is locks. So if you are the owner of a resource and you want to prevent people from actually download, uh, deleting it or, or writing to it, you can actually turn on different locks. So this example of turning on maybe like a read only or delete lock, you can add these uh, very, very granular on different pieces of this uh, and so, so folks won't be able to delete uh, your resource. That's there's a lot that you can actually do there um, inside of each and every subscription. Uh, performance testing is another piece that uh, is so easy to run. Um, whenever you're getting ready for like, let's just say a Black Friday sale, um, and you have a website and you wanna generate a load, uh, you can actually just go in here to new, give it a name, and then you can select the user load, and then you get the duration of how long you wanna run it. This is an absolutely fantastic way to see exactly how well your uh, performance of your website is. And we also have extensions. Extensions is, is a lot of times some of the things that people leave out. Uh, this just quickly adds functionality to a web app. And so here, you can actually go into your website. You can look for the extension. There's a variety of extensions that are already out there. And you can select one of them. Then you agree to the terms. Once you agree to the terms, you can see this one is already installed. And so now for this Azure web app, if I wanted to look at disk usage, now that I've installed this extension, it lives inside of my app service. I can click one button. And when this site finishes spinning up, 
you can see this is, a, this is an example of a disk usage that I could just quickly be able to navigate through. A nice kind of freebie, free to have. And the last one is one that I use all the time, and that is for alerts. Um, whenever I need to create different types of email alerts, uh, there's so much power that's inside of these alert rules. So I can do things like turn on the different types of metrics that I'm looking for, data in, data out, if it's HTTP errors. And I, you can set the condition, the threshold, and then you can simply add in different email addresses. So this could be just some of your other coworkers that you want to announce, maybe like the IT department. Hey, this thing's down, just go fix it and take care of it. Uh, with that said, I'm going to hand the controls over to my friend, Sissel. Oh, thank you. Hello. Oh, ooh, that's loud. All right, so I have about 10 minutes. Ooh. I have about 10 minutes, and I want to show you some demos about Cosmos DB. So we spoke a little bit about Cosmos today at the, um, inside, of the, inside of the keynote. Now, one of the things that you might want to do when you're working with Cosmos is, you know, locally on your machine, you might not be able to access Azure for whatever reason. You might be offline or disconnected from the network. But you want to try out Cosmos. You want to continue working with um, your application that you might be building. So one of the things that you could do is make use of this tool that we have called the Cosmos DB Emulator. And essentially what it does is it allows you to create collections, work with data, you know, and try some of your queries locally on the machine. So I already have it installed right here. And as you can see, it's running as like a web application experience. Um, and as I scroll down, you can see when I go to the quick start, I could do things like I could get a sample application running in .NET, .NET Core, um, something running in Java, Node.js, or even Python. So whatever application platform that you're running on, we have a, um, a sample that you could be able to try out. Now, if I head over to the Explorer, in here, you'll see I'll be able to you know, create my collections, and I can start issuing queries. But as of right now, I have this one collection called People. Um, I have my Documents tab, and as of right now, there's no data in here. So let me see how I could actually pull some data really quickly inside of my Cosmos instance. So I have this application that I've already pre-built. And let me make sure I can show you all the code really quickly. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this function called insert people async. And if you want to see what that looks like, I'm going to navigate this code around a little bit. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating an instance of this thing called a document client. And what that's going to allow me to do is connect to my instance that's living inside of Cosmos DB. And what I'm doing on line 43, um, since I actually don't have any data right now, I'm using this really helpful NuGet package called Bogus. And so what Bogus is going to do is just going to generate people for me. And it's going to populate my database with some, um, um, some data. Right? So I'm just going to run this really quickly. should take about a second or so. And then my database should have some, some data in there that we can start working with. So click, click, click. And there we go. So nothing too exciting there. But now if I come back to my local Cosmos uh, instance, you should see now I should have some data inside of here. As I scroll down, like I can, you, know, you can see everything that I have inside of that. If I edit the, um, let me do this. If I go to new query, I could do things like, you know, I could start filtering things out. So I could say where starts with, and I could use, you know, my document notation, C, for instance. And I could start executing queries, right? And I could see the results of my queries here at the bottom. Um, and I can even run aggregates if I wanted to. So let's say if I wanted to run an aggregate query, and I wanted to do a count, and I wanted to know um, how many people actually have the last name that begins with C. And you can see I'm getting back my, my query results. And again, this is all happening locally on my machine. Now, what happens when I'm done working locally and now I need to push this up into the cloud? Well, one of the tools that we have that we can make use of is the um, data migration tool. And with this, I could set my source to a JSON file. If you have a MongoDB that you might be working on locally, you could use that, um, Azure Table Storage, and some of these other things. So I've just put in my connection string here. And again, this is the connection string from my local Cosmos instance. I'm going to verify this. So that works great. I'm going to go to my target instance. So now this is an instance that's living in the cloud inside of Azure. And what I'm going to do, I'm pretty much just going to copy my code from one, um, from one instance to another. So I'm going to leave all this other stuff as the default. I'm going to hit import. And then in just a couple seconds, you should see it should say transfer 100. So I just moved 100 records over into, um, over into the cloud. So if I close this, so now remember, so this is my local instance. If I head back over here, and I'm going to go to our resource group that has our MS Builds 2018 instance. I'm going to go to the Data Explorer. 
right? And so I should have my collection, and I should have that same set of data that's there. So actually, if I just come back here, and if I, if I copy that same query, I'm going to be lazy and copy and paste this. If I copy that query, over, I, should get, I should be able to get the same results that we were seeing before. Right. So again, I just quickly took my Cosmos data from my local emulator, and I just moved it up into the cloud um, you know, using the, the migration tool. Now, we have data inside of the cloud, but one of the other things that I might want to do is, well, I might want to stand up an API of some sort to be able to access some of that information. And so one of the things I want to show you is how we could use Azure Functions to do that. So if I head back over to Visual Studio, I'm going to close this project, and I'm going to open another one. And this one is called MS Builds 2018. I'm going to set this at a starter project. I want to show you this Cosmos DB. There we go. I want to show you this Cosmos DB um, Azure function that I created. So if you're familiar with Azure Functions, it's essentially our serverless compute offering that we have. So I could write some code. I could send it up into the cloud. And now I don't have to worry too much about patching machines. I don't have to worry about you know, setting up backups or anything like that. Like I could just say, here, Azure, run my code, and it's just going to work for me. So what I'm doing here is I have this function that's set up. And actually, let me reduce the font size of this a little bit so it, it fits inside of the window. So I've created a function trigger using HTTP. So essentially, I'm creating like an HTTP API that could hit publicly. And now, this is going to trigger this function that's going to go and um, issue this document query that's going to pull some data out of my Cosmos. Now, I already have this deployed in the cloud. So if I head over to back to my resource group, and I can click on my function app, here you should see in a second or two, my function app should populate. And then we could start. Come on. Come on. There we go. So there's, so there's my function app. And now I should be able to find whatever the endpoint is, and I should be able to start making queries against this resource. So what I'm going to use is I'm going to click this thing that says get function URL. And then I'm going to open Postman. So Postman is a really handy tool for just issuing HTTP requests. You know, I could you know, create payloads, and I could specify different things about my requests that I want to send over. So I already have this here. I'm going to go ahead and issue this request. I'm going to send it. Dun, 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 dun. OK, there you go. And you can see my data now is coming back, back from that Cosmos instance. Now, now let's talk a little, bit more, a little bit more about Azure Functions and some of the things that we can do to customize that experience. So one of the things that you might have noticed is that when I issued that request, there was this really long string at the end of it. And essentially, that is my function key. Right? It's one of the things that we could use to give people access to calling this function. Now, it's not like a user. It's not somebody that I'm tracking. But it, essentially, it's like an API key. Right? And using this API key, I could say, OK, if you have this key, you could call this function. Now, one of the things we might want to do is we might want to be able to revoke these API keys or even renew them. Right? Let's say somebody compromises your key, and now you have to you know, disable that key. So what I'm going to do is inside of my function, I'm going to click on this Manage section. And inside of Manage, as I scroll down, you'll see I have different function keys. Right? I have my function key, and I also have my host key. Right? And so again, these are different codes that I could use inside of my function to start issuing these requests. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the key that we have. And so this is the one that I'm using now. Now, I'm going to renew this key. So essentially, I'm going to get a new one. And then when, that's, when, that, that, when, when this is finished, great. So now I'm just going to copy the key, and I'm going to attach that to my function. Notice now I can come in here, and I can copy that key without having to see it. Right? So if somebody has to come to your portal, you have to worry about them peeking over your shoulder and being like, oh, OK, there's this function key. So now I can come back in here. I can replace this code that I have at the end. And let me make sure I copy this properly. There we go. And now I'm, now I'm going to use that new function key. Right? And so now my data should be, you know, be working just as it was before. So that's how you could revoke and work with um, some of these function keys. Now, another thing that we could do is we could start enforcing SSL rules on top of your APIs. Now, you may or may not have noticed this. But um, whenever I call this function, I'm using this HTTPS MS builds endpoint. Right? So essentially what that's doing is it's using the local certificate that's already part of um, application services. And it's authenticating your, well, it's, it's encrypting your, your traffic that's going back and forth over HTTP. So what if I decided to do this? What if I took this off and I still made a request here? Right? 
my data is still coming back. Right? So let's say I don't want users to be able to access this endpoint using just regular HTTP, and I want to enforce HTTPS every time somebody makes this call. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on my function. I'm going to go to Platform Features, and I'm going to select SSL. And then whenever this blade loads, I'm going to have an option that's going to allow me to say HTTPS only. And then I'll select that option really quickly, and then once that's up, I should only be able to access my function using um, HTTPS. Are all of you guys on the Wi-Fi? I'm blaming you for this, because this is why my demo is being slow, because I know all of you guys are on the Wi-Fi on your phones right now. Let's try this again. Let me close this. I'm going to open SSL. Come on, dude. I really hate conference Wi-Fi. Um, let's see if I can access it from this one, if this one open. OK, great. So now, I have this specified to HTTPS. I'm going to make sure that this is on. And now, when I go back over to this, and I issue this with HTTP, oh, OK. But well, I'm still getting my, my function back. But it's, I have HTTP specified. Do you know why that might be happening? Anybody? So one thing that I would tell you to do, if you have any fairly sophisticated HTTPS tool, usually in their settings, they'll have this thing that says automatically follow redirects. And so what's happening is that I'm getting a 301 return to me. And that 301 is saying my resource has been moved, and now you need to follow this other URL to get it back. So actually, if I turn this off, I would issue the same request. Notice now we're getting a different response, right? Now my data is not showing. But notice it says 301 moved permanently, right? Because now I'm not following that HTTP redirect that, that came back. But if I inspect the headers, if you notice inside of the location header, it's telling me this is the URL that you need to use to call that, um, that function. So what do I need to do now? I need to come here. I need to put an S here for HTTPS. And if I run this and I go and check on what's inside of my body, notice now my data is coming back. So that's how you could easily come in and specify. You want to make sure that your function is running HTTPS only. All right, so I'm a little bit over time. So I want to show you one more demo really quickly. So we have this really cool service um, called Azure Container Instances. And essentially, what we wanted to do was make it super easy for you to come in and just run containers in Azure. So on our Docker Hub site, if you go down in the .NET Samples section, if I scroll down, we have a lot of different samples of Docker containers that are already built, and you could just download them and start trying them out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab one of these samples. And specifically, I'm going to grab the sample for an ASP.NET Core application. I'm going to copy this. And now back inside of the portal, I'm going to go into my resource group. And I'm going to create a new instance of um, well, Azure Container Instances. So I'm going to type in Container Instances. Oh, sorry. Went away. Instances. There we go. I'm going to create a new Container Instance. Right, and so now I'm just going to set up some basic configuration. So I'm going to call this ASP.NET Demo. Um, I'm going to give it the container image. And so that's the image, the image URI that I copied just now from my Docker Hub. I'm using Michael's subscription. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for using your money. And um, now we are going to select my resource group that I was using. So the resource group we have was, oh, actually, I need mine. The resource group we have was Azure Tips and Tricks. I'm going to put this in West US 2. I'm going to say OK. And now we can come in here now and specify some other options. Like I can select Windows or Linux if I wanted to, the number of cores, the number of memory, the ports I want to have exposed, so on and so forth. Um, we can just leave these as the defaults for now. Um, it's going to run a quick validation script, and now I'm just going to say OK. And now in a few seconds, what's going to happen in the background is that it's going to pull down that image. It's going to run through it and create a container for me. And then I'm going to have an endpoint, a publicly available IP address that I could use to access that service from. Um, and so you can imagine like, if you have your own containers that you're building, whether it's inside of your own infrastructure or maybe you're having it hosted on Docker Hub or somewhere else, you could very easily come in and then just have that hosted in Azure Container Instances. And so this should be done any second now. Um, and as soon as that's done, then we're going to take a look and see what it actually looks like inside of the portal. 
All right, I'm going to go ahead and click on this really quickly. And uh, OK, so you can see here, it already has our, our container resources here, but it's still deploying it. All right, and so, but this should be done in a little second. But you notice here, I already have my HTTP, um, my IP address endpoint that I could use. I'm going to go ahead and just, let's just run it and see if it's ready, just in case. I don't think it's ready yet. thinking about it. This is taking really long. But anyway, believe me that it works. Um, but that's pretty much essentially all you need to do to run containers inside of our Azure Container instances. So Michael, do you want to tell them really quick about our website? Yes. Absolutely. So if you're looking for a resource is just one. It's just azuredev.tips. Uh, if you go there, you can actually see a collection. There's about 120 tips uh, that's actually included in that whole massive collection. And uh, we're now starting to put in videos. So you can actually select between if you want to do videos or if you want to just read the written tutorial. And with that, I think that's it. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you.